Every week, we uncover tested tactical solutions to solve your company's toughest hiring challenges. Today, our guest is Carl Hardesky, CEO and founder of Hardesky LLC, a national executive services firm providing uh, both executive search services and on-demand executives to companies. Um, the firm has built their reputation in the CFO space based upon their rapid deployment and experience financial management resources through interim and project-based engagements. Carl is also uh, specialized in other C-suite roles, including CEO, COO, CIOs, um, and he's an exact expert um, coming from the CFO world in this, so I'm really happy to have you on the show today. Carl, welcome. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right, so we're going to cover a, a few things. First off, I want to educate our audience as to what burn rate is, um, the importance of managing it properly, and what to expect at various stages of the company lifestyle. Um, and then, you know, really how to, how to loop that into hiring and how to hire properly through each stage. It's a lot to cover. So, um, so let's, you know, I actually did a Google search last night, and we're talking about, um, so I'm looking at burn rate, and the first thing that comes up is the rate at which an enterprise spends money, especially venture capital, in excess of income. Um, so I'm going to let you chop that up. Is that, is that correct? That's a pretty uh, quick, concise uh, definition. Uh, yeah, most uh, emerging growth companies will be burning cash for um, their inception through sometimes as late as uh, four years into um, into their um, mission. Mm -hmm. So uh, managing that is hugely important. And obviously, if you don't manage your burn rate, you're going to run out of money. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, capital is king when you're when you're young. So what what to like? Um, so let's talk a little bit more about burn rate and and how that works at, at various stages. Sure. Um, so run me through. L let's run our audience through kind of the typical life cycle of a company. I start up. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple bucks. I decide, hey, look at I'm gonna I'm gonna start up a company, and then I get some people that are interested, and they give me some seed money. Right. right. So that's the first phase. Usually, friends and family. Yeah, friends and family, right? Um, we hope they remain your friends too. <laughs> yeah, as you always do. All right. So, um, how how does it, walk me through that process? So I get seed funding. Uh, what do I have to look out for? Like, you know, I mean, it, basically, that's usually to build the project or the product, and then it's just me working for free exactly yeah. or cheap or yeah so a lot i mean a lot of entrepreneurs i mean usually these entrepreneurs are they're either salespeople or engineers and they're going to develop a product uh, or software let's just pick on software because it's sort of a hot commodity here sure. another hot commodity here in orange county would be med medical device right yeah. so you're an engineer maybe you work for a large company and um you have an idea or maybe you could make a better widget so uh, let's say you have a few bucks and you're going to quit your job and, you know, invest some of your own money. You're going to watch that money very wisely. Sure. Uh, there, there's no money you watch more wisely than your own, right? Yeah. Uh, people get in trouble when they don't watch other people's money wisely. So, um, yeah. so you have a concept, you have an idea, maybe you bring a couple of people with you. And uh, if you think about that, okay, somebody's going to leave their day job and they're working for a big company getting paid benefits. How are you going to attract that person to that startup company? Yeah, um, is it the uh, the lure of cheap equity usually? Because you know it's not going to be a high pay rate, right? Because you don't have the funds to do it. In some cases, you know you're going to work free for a year. You and your fa your co-founders are going to work for no wages for a year. That's the plan until you get something, and you're going to raise some money through friends and family. Maybe you have a maybe you know a rich uncle or something that would invest and likes your idea. So that's you know that's getting off the ground. That's the yeah. Uh, so you get off you get off the ground and you go okay. Well, I've I've got something going. At what at, at what stage maybe do you kind of transition that into Series A? And then I would imagine the burn rate becomes very important at that point, right? Right. So in order to really launch a product and sell a product, you're probably going to need some permanent capital. Nobody's going to loan you money at that stage of your development, right? Yeah. So it's all going to come from typically VCs. So how do you attract a VC? Um, there are there are specific VCs that invest in A round, which is your first round of institutional capital outside of the friends and family round. So it's sure. going to be your second fundraising event. Might, the first might come from yourself and your friends, but or or actually angel investors too. Could, could be kind of in between yeah. a, a yeah. little bit, right? Kind of in between, yeah. yeah. So you could call an angel investor the A round, yeah, um, and then you know more institutional VCs your B round. But 
Um, and A, B, C, D just stands for, you know, the, the order of, of the money you're raising. So, yeah. and there's different aspects at each different uh, funding level that, and different investors that are going to come in at those different levels. But, y you know, you, if you're going to pay wages and rent buildings and, and buy stuff, you got to have capital. So, oh, yeah, sure. Um, so managing that burn rate, obviously you have no revenue. So your only source of funding is, 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 is um, equity. Yeah coming from uh, investors. So, you know, if you think about it, what's what's the expenses during your first year? If you're paying wages, you have to pay wages, maybe it's reduced wages, Yeah. office rent, you have to buy office equipment, those sorts of things. Software licenses. Software licenses, yeah. you know, computers. If you're a computer company, you're coding, you're sitting around, you know, maybe in a small room like this with five people developing code. Yeah. Or maybe those people are overseas and you're just managing that development process. Sure. All right. So um, when you've when you've got the Series A round, right? Um, I think that's usually when you start growing the company, right? That's when you start hiring on more people because you've got the resources to do it. Well, typically a, a round would be maybe proving your product. I mean, coming out with a beta test of a product. Sure. Um, one of my partners is involved in a startup company that that it's sort of a picture taking app that is really, really pretty cool. Their um, A round were all uh, people in the business and sure. in the entertainment and photography business, including a printer. And um, so all their initial funding, a couple million dollars of funding was from people they knew that would be interested in using that product. Well, there's a question now, would that be considered angel or would that be really a series A? I don't know. I debatable, yeah, yeah I would yeah. say it's probably Initial angel investors okay. and uh, um, yeah, because they're not institutional investors out w where their job is investing in companies. These people were going to use the product, yeah. help develop the product, yeah. market the product, and had an integral part in the success of the product. So Series A would really refer more to like that that there is an institution involved in that round. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. Just to clarify for some of right. our listeners, we have entrepreneurs that probably are getting started, so I want to make yes. sure that they're clear on that. Yes. All right, so um, so you're at the Series A round. What do you have to look out for uh, burn rate at at that point? Well, first thing, you're definitely burning cash, right? Yeah. So um, if you if you think about this process, you know, in a growing company, you're going to be burning money for two or three or four years, most likely. So the goal is to what's going to be the formula for getting your series B round, right? Yeah. So typically the series A investors will say, here's what you need to do. This money is going to be used specifically for this, for this, maybe it's to launch the product, a yeah. soft launch for a product. And if successful, we will invest in series B and we'll also bring it, bring along some of our more serious series B type VC investors along with us. Sure. So you have to, there's a milestone you have to make and it's, it's really product development at that stage. You don't have a big sales force because there's really nothing to sell, right? Yeah. So you don't need salespeople yet. Um, you're, you're probably having a bunch of developers if it's software or even if it's a medical device product. You know, you're in the lab, d you know, building prototypes. Mm -hmm. No revenue, so you're just you're just burning the investor's money. Okay. <laughs> hopefully okay. In, a, in an appropriate way. So then, you know, you hit your benchmarks, you move through, you're at Series B, right? Yes. You're able to close Series B. Yeah. What are the pitfalls or what do you got to look out for at that point? Well, now you've got a, a typically a less risky investor coming in who's not interested in doing that A uh, sort of proving uh, development round. Now you've got maybe a real product. Maybe it's launched. And, and you have some customers. Maybe you got a few yeah, customers. Yeah. And now it's okay. We want to hire some salespeople. We want to tweak our product a little more. Now we've got some capital. And there's usually another milestone uh that you know, and and believe me, before they were going to put in that money for the Series B, there is a use of funds um, that everybody's going go, going to agree to. Sure. Um, and you know, in that there are assumptions. When, and those use of funds are not to fund your lifestyle. It, no, no. <laughs> and we, and yeah, we've seen companies do that, <laughs> like going out and you know purchasing you know expensive office furniture. That's like the most ridiculous use of. Series B money, you, know, you can go buy office furniture for pennies on the dollar, or leasing too much space, you know, yeah. uh, just buying too expensive equipment, you know. The, so those are some of the pitfalls you see on the on at, yeah. at that around yeah. that stage. Yeah, just uh, inappropriate uses of those funds when uh, um, you know it should be spent on labor and getting that uh, uh, 
uh, that product developed and, and or sales, but you don't need fancy offices. You're going to have to you know, stay in your garage for a while. Or you don't need class A office space, you know, being C or B office space. So what is, you know, I, I know you want to provide, especially these days, you want to provide a great working environment. You want to be able to attract talent. Um, so what what is the, you know, Where's the the tipping point as far as buying nicer office furniture? I mean, like you know, what what are investors cool with, and where do they have a problem? You know, great question. Yeah, and especially we, we, when it yeah. comes to the burn rate. I mean, you're yeah, absolutely. It's going to burn through a lot of money. Yeah. So in, in this environment, think about this environment. We have a super low unemployment. Uh, I think Orange County is two point four percent. I yeah. think for college educated people, it's even less, which is almost zero unemployment. Yeah. So competition for any sort of worker is highly competitive right now. So oh what's, yeah. what's going to attract that worker to your new startup company? So it's either going to be somebody you know, somebody who's polluting your vision, somebody who's sick of working for big company and wants to s be early employee with a company they see, you know, getting big where they can participate yeah. in the equity. That's what's going to attract um, those employees. Those are going to be, those employees are going to be more risk takers and, um, and those are the kind of people you want. They want to sacrifice a little bit of their wages get some of that equity, and then participate in that growth. Sure, sure. It's, it's a different type of employee. It's, it's not going to be that employee that needs a stable, you know, high-end paycheck. Yeah, yeah. You know. But, I mean, you know, uh, I guess that's – so um, when we're talking about the, the office furniture and the other expenditures, right, mm -hmm. labor is going to be the, the biggest cost that most R companies are going to have, right? Right, right. Um, but, you know, when you go all out and put a million dollars into an office space and you got too much office space, I mean yeah. – I you can't afford it at that stage. Yeah. You know? So you have to attract those people without that fancy office, without the ping pong table in the corner, without yeah. free lunches and a cafeteria, you know, what uh, yeah. some of these big companies have. So, so, so you're looking for buy-in at that stage. You're I mean, looking you for buy-in. you got to connect with people emotionally. Uh, uh, yeah, in a different level. It's not the high pay or, or the fancy office. It's going to be something else. And, and in this market, when you have a really low employment rate, it's tough because – you really you, you have all these companies that are out there that are throwing lots of money at people. Absolutely, I mean it's very tough for the large successful companies, uh, you know the Facebooks and Googles and all those big companies that have plenty of money. They got fancy offices, they have trouble attracting employees, and yeah. you know there's really no loyalty with the employers anymore. So the employees view themselves as free agents, which they are, yeah. and they'll move after three months to for you know, five five more. minutes closer to my house. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, in, and we'll talk about this on the back end of the show, but I found that, like, money usually is fourth or fifth down the road. Yes. Like, you know, a lot yes. of times with most people. But yes. All right. So now we get past this Series B and we get into, like, we're, okay, we're maybe a company that's generating quite a bit of revenue. Um, I, when, you're at s when you're raising your Series C mm -hmm. round, I mm -hmm. mean, where are you typically there in, in – well, usually, um, if you've if you've been successful with the B and spent the money right, and you're in a market that's attractive, you're not going to have a problem raising Series C round. The question is, you know, if you're the owner founder, how much equity do you have to give up for that sure. that C round? So it becomes a big valuation issue. Sure. So the VCs are going to have their way; they're going to value it. The seller, you know, who's going to sell a piece of the company to the the uh, round C investor, they're going to have their valuation. So you're, you're going to have a, you know, uh, a discussion, a meeting of the minds on what that's that's worth, where it's going. It, it depends on the market you're in, and and um, and, and again, it, usually at that stage, if the you brought in B round investors and things are going well, they're going to want to participate in the C round as well. Yeah. Well, isn't that typically a C round is where you're really scaling too? You're scaling. That's when you're hiring. Salespeople, more programmers. You're refining your yeah. product. Now you've got, you would. Th this is where you would have enough money to come in and start paying market salaries. Sure. Uh, having you know benef better benefits of, that a big company might have. You have maybe a little bit. You've moved into a different building now, and um, you it know, seems you to me like this is probably the stage though where burn rate is most important. Yeah, you're burning more money. Cause yeah. Th think about it. Now you don't have ten employees now. Now you have a hundred. But you also have to balance that that influx of cash. I mean, you've yes. it's a lot more tricky at that it, point, It's right? very tricky. So just from, you know, I'm a, I'm a CFO by trade. So, yeah. so mm -hmm. you think about, okay, I, I have to tell my investors how much money we're going to burn over the next 12 months. Okay, depends on our revenue ramp up. Depends on how many people we hire. So look at this. If I can't hire salespeople to increase the sales – I'm going to miss that projection. Yeah. And then um, if I'm hiring other people, 
we um, maybe we can hire other people quickly, and we've got other people coders that are just you know I- you know incurring wages and so on. I'm going to miss my revenue number, and I'm yeah. gonna, and I'm going to inc- my burn rate it's estimate gonna go is going to go through the roof. Through the roof. Yeah. you know so it's it's a real hard thing to manage because you don't know what the ramp up's going to be, and uh, there's so many factors. So again, in this tight em- employment market, if you can't hire quality salespeople. You know, on your scheduled times, then the sales aren't going to ramp up, and then your burn rate's going to be excessive, and you're yeah. going to, you know, you're, you're going to have to go talk to the board about, hey, I, I missed the burn rate. We need more money. That's such great insight, Carl. So we're talking to Carl Hardesky, the founder and CEO of Hardesky LLC. We're going to take a quick break. Um, we've actually just covered burn rate and kind of what it is. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, kind of the importance of burn rate, especially on different levels and how to properly recruit talent through each stage. We'll be right back. You're listening to Hire Power with Rick Gerard, giving you access to recruiting techniques that will help you hire key talent to build your company towards real success. Rick is a recruiting executive and entrepreneur who's been successfully recruiting in the aggressive Silicon Valley technology landscape for the past two decades. After a very successful stint at Apogee, he founded Stride Search in 2012. Based on a lean efficiency model, Stride has uniquely positioned itself as a leader in retained search for the most critical talent hires within a small organization. Whether you're a startup executive or recruiting professional, by listening to Hire Power with Rick Gerard, you will walk away with skills to help you attract and hire great talent. Now back to Hire Power with Rick Gerard. And welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Rick Gerard, and you're listening to Hire Power. Today, our guest is Carl Hardesky, the uh, CEO and founder of Hardesky LLC. And uh, we're discussing uh, burn rate and the importance of kind of managing the burn rate at different stages of the company. Now, we're going to explore kind of uh, alternative kind of resources and how to, uh, how to properly re- kind of recruit and, and find those talents at each stage. So during the break, um, Carl, you and I were talking a little bit about kind of a piece of this, this will lead into recruiting, which is outsourcing, right? Yeah, outsourcing can be incredibly uh, efficient as you're growing your company. Um, example might be outsourced accounting. You know, do, you, do you need to hire an accountant early on, or can you push that out to a firm that does accounting? Yeah, in today's market, that's a lot. It, like I've, I've seen a lot of fractional HR and fractional CEOs. Yes, and, and there's CEOs, fractional everything. Fractional everything, <laughs> fractional recruiters. And it, it's very yeah. efficient. There's, you know, uh, I always make the, uh, uh, the, the the argument that you might need a CFO. You might not need a CFO 40 hours a week. You might need a CFO 10 hours a week, 10 hours a month. A lot of people don't know that that's available, and it can be an incredibly valuable um, uh, skill to add on a part-time basis as you're growing. Well, I would imagine, especially when you're young, when, when you're a young company, because you're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. And we, we, we see a lot of mistakes being made. Where If we would have been there, we would have said, don't do that. You know, that's not a good use of the funds. Yeah. So, you know, let, let's talk about that. You're, you're a seed friend and family, you know, funded or maybe like, you know, 500 startups got nice enough to, you know, throw some money in your company. Um, hiring somebody who's an expert outside of what you're doing is pretty probably the wisest thing you can do with that money i would imagine absolutely i yeah. mean like like take like uh, take leasing a building for example yeah i mean you're going to grow let's say you've got an estimate you're going to add 50 employees next year 50 the next year you don't take out down all the space for 100 employees if you yeah. can you'd want to take down space and stage that stage that that lease or that rent expense now can you always do that no you can't always do that i've got one uh, friend right now he had to take down an entire building he's doing a medical device um, it's not a startup, but it's it's emerging growth. Okay. He had to take down an entire building, even though he's not going to occupy that building probably fully for two years. Oof. Yeah. Just so because he's got to eat a be- lot of rent on Yeah, that. he's got to eat a lot of rent. He knows it. Uh, their investors know it. But, um, you know, that was the option here in Orange County. Okay, got it. Yeah, and space also is very limited here as well. Very limited. I mean, some of the uh, industrial mm-hmm. space is, like, non-existent. So. All right, so let's break down. Uh, y- let's say you just get some money, right? Um, what do you need? What, what would be the prudent thing to do with the money you're spending? Uh, hire out a fractional, what, um, CFO to help you really get the financial structure in place? Well, you might need, um, I mean, if you think about basic, you know, you're probably going to need like an executive assistant, right? Sure. Okay, one of the things that um, is really uh, uh, 
popular lately is uh, professional employee organizations. So you can you can actually hire your employees, but they're actually in another organization. And through that, you can get better benefits for your employees. B- you know, you can get big company benefits. Is that like a PPO or something? Yeah, yeah. well, it's a PEO, professional PEO, employee organization. Right, okay. So they're called co-employment, but there's a lot of firms that do it. There's firms that specialize doing it for, uh, for tech companies. But what you get with that is all the compliance, because trying to be compliant with uh, employee rules in California is almost impossible. It's ridiculous. So yeah. with the PEO, you're going to get access to a trained compliance HR executive. Uh, you're going to get access to bigger benefits, and they manage all your payroll. So you just write them one check a month, and they, they pay all your employees. They're, they're your employees, their employees, but they call it co-employment. That, that's a really efficient model for a lot of companies rather than trying to do your own your own payroll. Got it. Okay. So um, so recruiting. Let's let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, I'm a seed-funded company. How do I get people to join my company? I mean, <laughs> you, you actually touched upon that in the right. first part. but right. Um, you don't have any money to pay them, so you you really gotta you gotta have a good. You, you have to be a charismatic uh, entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you you've gotta you've gotta find the people that are passionate about what you're building. Right. I mean, if somebody's gonna like you right. said, if somebody's gonna give up something. Right. Now, normally, you know, before you go ahead and start your own firm, you might have had that discussion. Let's say you're with a company and like you know, a group of you're gonna go leave and start your own company. You're, you've got a little bit of a team you know that's going to leave and go do that sure if you're just starting your own company in your garage you're going to try to attract employees that is really difficult yeah you, so um what i would say is um i would say be very visible be uh, visible in your industry be vis- visible in, in the business community and you'll be able to attract employees um or potential employees potential investors um you know don't hang out in your garage all day long yeah yeah you know all right, so let's talk about a little bit about that. How do you be visible here in Orange County? I mean, there's lots of. Oh, there's so there. Orange County is an easy place to be visible. There's so many great organizations that you can join, industry associations, um, or um, specific, you know, M and A organizations. <laughs> I'm a member of Association for Corporate Growth, which is all about um, financing and selling and preparing businesses for sale. Okay. Um, you know, it's just a fantastic way to meet people. But there's, I mean, there's. Chambers of Commerce. There's all these. Uh, there's startup type uh, organizations. There's a group called Octane. And yeah, Octane's a great, organization. great, great organization. So being visible in those, meeting other people, um, you know, that's where all your, a lot of your first employees are going to come from. People you meet in those circles. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And in you know, getting those, um, getting those, uh, that network and building up that network is is huge. You know, I've been investing a lot of time in the past couple of years doing that as well since i'm fairly new to orange county so. yeah i mean I, I found employees myself through uh, these various organizations yeah absolutely all right so we get into um kind of your first round of funding series a and i always find that this is my favorite stage because the company has money and they can pay me <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah but but also um i think the opportunity for growth if you really package things properly for the right person um, the money becomes kind of secondary. But this, this is, like, again, the big draw at these two phases is primarily the equity for most people. Yeah, equity. Everybody always wants to tell a story. I was employee number three at, you know, ABC Success Company that went, you know, ballistic and, and uh, cr- you know, was sold for a billion dollars. You know, that's everybody's yeah. story. Th- that's the type of people you're going you're gonna to attract at, uh, at that stage. They're still going to need some pay. I mean, most people who are, let's say, in their 20s or 30s can't afford to, unless they're living with their parents and their parents are completely providing for them, yeah. are going to need some money. Yeah. But they'll work for a, you know, below a fair market value wage in exchange for some equity. Yeah. Uh, they won't do it forever, um, but, you know. And I, I usually see, like, about 50-50 split of people at that stage that, like, will actually take less salary in exchange for more stock. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll, they'll, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll cut their salary for stock quit. Right. Know. Um, sometimes people don't just because of whatever family constraints or what have you. Yeah, some people just you just can't afford to do it. There, yeah. there are situations they just can't. They they need the maximum comp they can cash comp they can they can get. Yeah, yeah. So they're true. they're going to stick with the larger companies that have that can pay more. And but there's you know they're not going to make any money on the equity, right? Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Um, so and again, you know, at at this stage and and even kind of Series B stage, I think they're both fairly similar. I mean, those are usually when you're starting to shift into more growth. You're still one of the early employees. Um, there, there's still that 
that buy-in that people have to, you have to engage people emotionally um, to make it a non-transactional you know mo uh, mm -hmm. or non-monetary compensation and right you know as kind of Lou Adler calls it yes you know th these days some companies can get significant Series A funding. I mean, we're talking about 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollars of Series A funding. Mm -hmm. You know, with that amount of capital, the investors might say, I want you to go out and hire a top engineer and do what you have to to get that person on board. And, you know, they'll have a, they'll have a range of comp, and the more cash comp that person demands, the less equity they're going to get. But they'll mm -hmm. be able to, if they, if they need to, they'll be able to pay fair market value wages for that, that executive. And they'll make a compromise on the equity because it's really important at that stage. So, even early on, um, some companies will have, though they will have the funds to pay those salaries. But not for everybody, they have to make that that stretch that that Series A funding as, as far as they can. Yeah. But for for certain positions, they will make that investment if that's what they have to do. Sure. Well, you know, so. Really, in between seed funding and Series A is really when you need to start building out your executive team, right? Because right. It, you're not going to get a Series A most likely without an executive team on board. You might have a partial executive team, or some of the Series A money might be able to go complement the rest of your your uh, executive team. So let's say you had the founder. Or let's say the founder is an engineer mm -hmm. with you know some decent sales skills. <laughs> okay, what do you need? Maybe you need a, a COO to really you know, manage all the and other, other stuff. And f and you're going to deal with that for the first year. You're not going to go hire that CFO or that, that sales guy or, or the HR person or whatever it is for a year. And that's going to be the plan. You're just going to have to get by without it. Yeah. Um, and then you hit a certain um, stage and, okay, we you know, we're going to hire this this um, executive. Well, at what, pla <coughs> at what stages, though, like in the, in the funding stage, do typically you see that, um, you look at, we've got a founder, founders really kind of, you know, we've got our founding leadership team, they're kind of over their head at this point. I mean, you know, we need to bring in a professional to kind of handle things, mm -hmm. you know. Um, is that usually like after Series B, Series C, when they're really pushing for kind of scale, scaling the company? Yeah, C is really, you know, you, you've got a product, now you're... Uh, you're going to blow that product out, right? Yeah. That's where you're going to. So you're going to go hire a, a national sales team. You're going to open offices around the country, or maybe around the world. We got a local company here that this was in their. They did that in their D round. Um, they picked up forty million dollars from a Class A, you know, world class investor, and now they're building out their international sales team. Mm -hmm. But they're still hiring coders, and um, ramping up, and they're still burning a lot of money. Yeah. So, um, but it's like. There, it's a market grab for um, for customers right now, and the goal is um, signing up signing up customers, keeping that revenue growth rate going. Got it. Oh, man, I wish we had a little bit more time, but I'm getting the, the signal from Paul, our engineer, that we're running out of time here. So, um, Carl, thanks again for your time investment and um, in the show today and uh, sharing your knowledge. It's been uh, it's been great having you. Thank you. And and welcome to the Higher Power Radio community. Yeah. Um, now, I, I'm sure some of our listeners are going to want to reach out, especially for some of your services. What's the best way for them to reach you? Well, we have a website, uh, hardestyllc.com, okay. and uh, all of our contact information is on there. Um, we have an office Spell here. Spell Hardesty, if you could. Hardesty is H-A-R-D-E-S-T-Y. Okay, dot it's, com. It's British, by the way. All right. <laughs> From what I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And uh, cool. what um, what what people? I mean, you know, who who would be uh, wise to reach out to you? Well, uh, any founder who wants some advice on on hiring uh, or financing, growing, and we do a lot of we'll do we'll do some pro pro bono work for people just getting off the ground. Sure. I mean, most of our clients are funded. They've either gone through an A, B, or C, or D round, or they're they're founder owned and or family owned, and they're getting ready to grow and and add an executive. Um, but we have all types, and we're, we're primarily a middle market and lower middle market type type company. Although we've got a couple clients over a billion dollars, but um, you know, Orange County is a middle market and emerging growth marketplace. Yeah, well, we're what the fifth largest ca ca county in the nation, right? Is that true? I think so, something like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, with that, <laughs> with that diversion, um, yeah. uh, they, I, I want to thank our listening audience for tuning into this week's episode of Higher Power. 
Um, a quick thanks to our team, our engineer, Paul Roberts, our producers, Andrea Ballin, Shanti Ryle, and our executive producer, Kim Iverson. To listen to this show and any past episodes, you can check us out at Hire, that's H-I-R-E, PowerRadio.com. There's two R's there. Or Hire Power Radio on iTunes. Uh, follow us again also on, on Facebook and LinkedIn at Higher Power Radio Show. Or you can follow me on Twitter at Rick underscore Gerard. So we have uh, another really good show uh, lined up for you guys next week. Our guest is going to be Craig Cook, the co-founder and CEO of Rhythm Interactive. I'm your host, Rick Gerard, and you have been listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. Aloha. Thank you for listening to Higher Power with Rick Gerard on OC Talk Radio. Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for another episode of OC Spotlight, the only show that brings to light the issues and organizations shaping our community. And today,